This is Audible. The New York Times best-selling book, You Are the Placebo, Making Your Mind Matter, by Dr. Joe Dispenza. Read by Adam Boyce. Copyright 2014 by Dr. Joe Dispenza. For my mother, Francesca. Preface. Waking up. I never planned on doing any of this. The work I'm currently involved in as a speaker, author, and researcher sort of found me. In order for some of us to wake up, we sometimes need a wake-up call. In 1986, I got the call. On a beautiful Southern California day in April, I had the privilege of being run over by an SUV in a Palm Springs triathlon. That moment changed my life and started me on this whole journey. I was 23 at the time, with a relatively new chiropractic practice in La Jolla, California, and I'd trained hard for this triathlon for months. I had finished the swimming segment and was in the biking portion of the race when it happened. I was coming up to a tricky turn where I knew we'd be merging with traffic. A police officer with his back to the oncoming cars waved me on to turn right and follow the course. Since I was fully exerting myself and focused on the race, I never took my eyes off of him. As I passed two cyclists on that particular corner, a red four-wheel drive Bronco, going about 55 miles an hour, slammed into my bike from behind. The next thing I knew, I was catapulted up into the air, then I landed squarely on my backside. Because of the speed of the vehicle and the slow reflexes of the elderly woman driving the Bronco, the SUV kept coming toward me, and I was soon reunited with its bumper. I quickly grabbed the bumper in order to avoid being run over and to stop my body from passing between metal and asphalt. So I was dragged down the road a bit before the driver realized what was happening. When she finally did abruptly stop, I tumbled out of control for about 20 yards. I can still remember the sound of the bikes whizzing by and the horrified screams and profanities of the riders passing me, not knowing whether they should stop and help or continue the race. As I lay there, all I could do was surrender. I would soon discover that I had broken six vertebrae. I had compression fractures in thoracic 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, and lumbar 1, ranging from my shoulder blades to my kidneys. The vertebrae are stacked like individual blocks in the spine, and when I hit the ground with that kind of force, they collapsed and compressed from the impact. The eighth thoracic vertebrae, the top segment that I broke, was more than 60% collapsed and the circular arch that contained and protected the spinal cord was broken and pushed together in a pretzel-like shape. When a vertebrae compresses and fractures, the bone has to go somewhere. In my case, a large volume of shattered fragments went back toward my spinal cord. It was definitely not a good picture. As if I were in a bad dream gone rogue, I woke up the next morning with a host of neurological symptoms, including several different types of pain, varying degrees of numbness, tingling, and some loss of feeling in my legs, and some sobering difficulties in controlling my movements. So after I had all the blood tests, x-rays, CAT scans, and MRIs at the hospital, the orthopedic surgeon showed me the results and somberly delivered the news. In order to contain the bone fragments that were now on my spinal cord, I needed surgery to implant a Harrington rod. That would mean cutting out the back parts of the vertebrae from two to three segments, above and below the fractures, and then screwing and clamping two 12-inch stainless steel rods along both sides of my spinal column. Then they'd scrape some fragments off my hip bone and paste them over the rods. It would be a major surgery, but it would mean I'd at least have a chance to walk again. Even so, I knew I'd probably still be somewhat disabled, and I'd have to live with chronic pain for the rest of my life. Needless to say, I didn't like that option. But if I chose not to have the surgery, paralysis seemed certain. The best neurologist in the Palm Springs area, who concurred with the first surgeon's opinion, told me that he knew of no other patient in the United States in my condition who had refused it. The impact of the accident had compressed my T8 vertebrae into a wedge shape that would prevent my spine from being able to bear the weight of my body if I were to stand up. My backbone would collapse pushing those shattered bits of the vertebrae deep into my spinal cord, causing instant paralysis from my chest down. That was hardly an attractive option either. I was transferred to a hospital in La Jolla, closer to my home, where I received two additional opinions, 
including one from the leading orthopedic surgeon in Southern California. Both doctors agreed that I should have the Harrington Rod surgery. It was a pretty consistent prognosis. Have the surgery or be paralyzed never to walk again. If I had been the medical professional making the recommendation, I'd have said the same thing. It was the safest option. But it wasn't the option I chose for myself. Maybe I was just young and bold at that time in my life, but I decided against the medical model and the expert recommendations. I believe that there's an intelligence, an invisible consciousness within each of us that's the giver of life. It supports, maintains, protects, and heals us every moment. It creates almost a hundred trillion specialized cells, starting from only two, and keeps our hearts beating hundreds of thousands of times per day, and it can organize hundreds of thousands of chemical reactions in a single cell in every second, among many other amazing functions. I reasoned at the time that if this intelligence was real, and if it willfully, mindfully, and lovingly demonstrated such amazing abilities, maybe I could take my attention off my external world and begin to go within and connect with it, developing a relationship with it. But while I intellectually understood that the body often has the capacity to heal itself, now I had to apply every bit of philosophy that I knew in order to take that knowledge to the next level and beyond, to create a true experience with healing. And since I wasn't going anywhere, and I wasn't doing anything except lying face down, I decided on two things. First, every day I would put all of my conscious attention on this intelligence within me and give it a plan, a template, a vision with very specific orders. And then I would surrender my healing to this greater mind that has unlimited power, allowing it to do the healing for me. And second, I wouldn't let any thought slip by my awareness that I didn't want to experience. Sounds easy, right? Against the advice of my medical team, I left the hospital in an ambulance that brought me to the home of two close friends, where I stayed for the next three months to focus on my healing. I was on a mission. I decided that I would begin every day reconstructing my spine vertebrae by vertebrae, and I would show this consciousness, if it was paying attention to my efforts, what I wanted. I knew that it would demand my absolute presence. That is, for me, to be present in the moment, not thinking about or regretting my past, worrying about the future, obsessing about the conditions in my external life, or focusing on my pain or symptoms. Just as in any relationship we have with anybody, we all know when someone is present or not with us, right? Because consciousness is awareness, awareness is paying attention, and paying attention is being present and noticing, this consciousness would be aware of when I was present and when I wasn't. I would have to be totally present when I interacted with this mind. My presence would have to match its presence. My will would have to match its will. And my mind would have to match its mind. So for two hours, twice a day, I went within and began creating a picture of my intended result. A totally healed spine. Of course, I became aware of how unconscious and unfocused I was. It's ironic, I realized back then when crisis or trauma occurs, we spend too much of our attention and energy thinking about what we don't want instead of what we do want. During those first several weeks, I was guilty of this tendency on what seemed like a moment-to-moment -moment basis. In the middle of my meditations on creating the life I wanted with a fully healed spine, I would all of a sudden become aware that I'd been unconsciously thinking about what the surgeons had told me a few weeks prior, that I would probably never walk again. I would be in the midst of inwardly reconstructing my spine, and the next thing I knew, I was stressing over whether I should sell my chiropractic practice. While I was step-by-step step mentally rehearsing walking again, I would catch myself imagining what it would be like to live the rest of my life sitting in a wheelchair. You get the idea. So every time I lost my attention and my mind wandered to any extraneous thoughts, I would start from the beginning and do the whole scheme of imagery over again. It was tedious frustrating and, quite frankly, one of the most difficult things I've ever done. But I reasoned that the final picture that I wanted the observer in me to notice had to be clear, unpolluted and uninterrupted. In order for this intelligence to accomplish what I hoped, what I knew it was capable of doing from start to finish, I had to stay conscious and not go unconscious. 
Finally, after six weeks of battling with myself and making the effort to be present with this consciousness, I was able to make it through my inward reconstruction process without having to stop and start over from the beginning. I remember the day I did it for the first time. It was like hitting a tennis ball on the sweet spot. There was something right about it. It clicked. I clicked. And I felt complete, satisfied and whole. For the first time, I was truly relaxed and present, in mind and body. There was no mental chatter, no analyzing, no thinking, no obsessing, no trying. Something lifted, and a kind of peace and silence prevailed. It was as if I no longer cared about all of the things I should have been worried about in my past and future. And that realization solidified the journey for me, because right around that time, as I was creating this vision of what I wanted, reconstructing my vertebrae, it started to get easier every day. Most important, I started to notice some pretty significant physiological changes. It was in that moment that I began to correlate what I was doing inside of me to create this change with what was taking place outside of me, in my body. The instant I made that correlation, I paid greater attention to what I was doing, and I did it with more conviction. And I did it again, and again. As a result, I kept doing it with a level of joy and inspiration, instead of such a dreadful, compromised effort. And all of a sudden, what had originally taken me two or three hours to accomplish in one session, I was able to do in a shorter period. Now, I had quite a bit of time on my hands. So I started to think about what it would be like to see a sunset again from the water's edge, or eat lunch with my friends at a table in a restaurant. And I thought about how I would never take any of that for granted. In detail, I imagined taking a shower and feeling the water on my face and body, or simply sitting up while using the toilet, or taking a walk on the beach in San Diego, the wind blowing on my face. These were some of the things that I had never fully appreciated before the accident, but now they had meaning, and I took my time to emotionally embrace them until I felt as if I were already there. I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but now I do. I was actually starting to think about all of these future potentials that existed in the quantum field, and then I was emotionally embracing each of them. And as I selected that intentional future and married it with the elevated emotion of what it would be like to be there in that future, in the present moment my body began to believe it was actually in that future experience. As my ability to observe my desired destiny got sharper and sharper, my cells began to reorganize themselves. I began to signal new genes in new ways, and then my body really started getting better faster. What I was learning is one of the main principles of quantum physics, that mind and matter are not separate elements, that our conscious and unconscious thoughts and feelings are the very blueprints that control our destiny. The persistence, conviction and focus to manifest any potential future lies within the human mind and within the mind of the infinite potentials in the quantum field. Both of these minds must work together in order to bring about any future reality that potentially already exists. I realize that in that way, we are all divine creators, independent of race, gender, culture, social status, education, religious beliefs, or even past mistakes. I felt really blessed for the first time in my life. I made other key decisions about my healing as well. I set up a whole regime, described in detail in Involve Your Brain, that included diet, visits from friends who practiced energy healing, and an elaborate rehabilitation program. But nothing was more important to me during that time than getting in touch with that intelligence within me, and through it, using my mind to heal my body. At nine and a half weeks after the accident, I got up and walked back into my life, without having any body cast or any surgeries. I had reached full recovery. I started seeing patients again at ten weeks, and was back to training and lifting weights again while continuing my rehabilitation at twelve weeks. And now, almost thirty years after the accident, I can honestly say that I've hardly ever had back pain since. But that wasn't the end of this adventure. Not surprisingly, I couldn't go back into my life as my same self. I was changed in many ways. I'd been initiated into a reality that no one I knew could really understand. I couldn't relate with a lot of my friends, and I certainly couldn't return to the same life. The things that were once so important to me really no longer mattered. 
and I started asking big questions like, Who am I? What is the meaning of this life? What am I doing here? What is my purpose? And what or who is God? I left San Diego within a short time and moved to the Pacific Northwest, eventually opening a chiropractic clinic near Olympia, Washington. But at first, I pretty much retreated from the world and studied spirituality. In time, I also became very interested in spontaneous remissions, when people healed from a serious disease or condition deemed terminal or permanent, without traditional medical interventions like surgery or drugs. On those long, lonely nights during my recovery when I couldn't sleep, I had made a deal with that consciousness that, if I were ever able to walk again, I'd spend the rest of my life investigating and researching the mind-body connection and the concept of mind over matter. And that's pretty much what I've been doing in the nearly three decades since then.